you turn in your copy of God's Word now to the Gospel of John, I'll be reading there this morning in chapter 3, the first 18 verses. It's on your pew Bible at page 1,129. You'll be familiar with this passage. This is the passage where John records the visit of Nicodemus to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's give attention now to the Word of God. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. As far in the reading of God's word, amen. Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, as we now come to a passage in Scripture which is familiar to many of us, we pray, Lord God, that you would give us this morning fresh ears to hear. Have mercy upon us, Father. Send your Spirit. Illumine our path that we may have an understanding that comes from you and from no other place. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we minister to refugees in Clarkston, one of the things that we are seeing is that some come to this country because they need medical services. One of the families that we met when we first got here was a family with a son whose spine was crooked. It needed to be straightened. There were so many things that were going wrong in his body because his, his spine was, was crooked and the process to straighten the, the crooked spine was somewhat involved and complex. First they had to put him into traction for not just hours, but days. And then after that traction period was over, they performed surgery, they the surgeons. Uh, and that surgery lasted hours, uh, an entire day, basically. And then after the surgery was a period of recovery and therapy, all due to the crooked spine. It's a bit of a picture of our hearts that were made crooked at the fall. It affected everything within us, all of our lives, sinful throughout, not the straightest thing within. Nothing right, 
no one righteous. The thing is that the solution for our crooked heart was much simpler than straightening out this young man's spine. As we read this morning, just now, the solution is believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. As John continues to open up his gospel, here he's describing Jesus Christ as the eternal word, as God himself. He's showing now who Jesus Christ is. As he's performed his first supernatural act in as turning water to wine, he's demonstrating his sovereign power over all of creation. Demonstrating that this is the God-man, Jesus the creator of all things, who's good and gives good things to his children. This morning, this morning, as we get into this passage, I want us to see that, that through his evangelistic ministry, Jesus demonstrates his nature and his love for his Father and brings healing to the children of God. Through his evangelistic ministry, Jesus demonstrates his nature and his love for his Father and brings healing to the children of God. We'll see that in four simple points this morning. The composed evangelist, the candid evangelist, the consistent evangelist, and the committed evangelist. As we go through this this morning, I want us to be thinking about what what is the objective, what's the goal of an evangelist? What's the end goal? Let's look first now at the the composed evangelist. Now, as Nicodemus approaches the Lord Jesus Christ, you would say, well, this was a a gracious approach. This was a kind approach. This was a a flattering approach, even. Uh, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is, is with him. Rabbi, it's a title. It's a title of honor. Uh, a title which the folks were used to using, apparently, to address their teachers and to honor them. He also said, you're from God, and that God is with him. But w- what seems to be a gracious approach on the surface, possibly, possibly was, was shrouded in darkness. See, I think Nicodemus had at least two problems going on as he approached the Lord Jesus Christ. And these two things go together. First, as he approached Christ, his thought about Judaism, about what we know today uh, as the religion of Christianity, was merely a teaching. Merely a teaching. That the laws of God were given to be taught, to be explained, to be expounded, to be followed... That was the way you would earn and merit your way into the kingdom. Good teaching, good laws, but merely a teaching. And then, coupled with that, his confession was not that Jesus was God, but that he was from God and that God was with him. See, that's much different than confessing that Jesus was, in fact, God himself. And so these two things go together. The the idea that the Scriptures were merely good teachings and that Jesus was not, in fact, God, was was actually an offensive approach by Nicodemus. But these were the things that were within his being. The whole premise on which Nicodemus then approached Jesus Christ was not only false, not only erroneous, but offensive to Jesus. Well, the remainder of this passage, then, is really the response of Jesus to Nicodemus' approach. The approach of a self-reliant, a works-righteous, a God-disparaging Pharisee. So what does Jesus do? What does Jesus not do is probably our first step. He does not end the conversation, obviously. He doesn't shut the door. He doesn't ask Nicodemus to leave. He doesn't rebuke. He doesn't rebuff Nicodemus. But he engages him. He draws him in to a deep spiritual conversation. And Jesus was composed. Throughout all of it, 
Webster says that's free from agitation. He was calm, he was sedate, he wasn't quiet, he spoke, but he was composed, he was under control. His emotions weren't flying about. Jesus was always controlling himself, his human expressions and his human feelings. And so Jesus now in calmness, in patience, in composure, walks Nicodemus through the gospel. He opens up the only way of salvation to a man who was dying, in fact, to a man who was dead. Think of this significance of this. That Jesus didn't stop. That Jesus didn't rebuke him, but now he leads him. Now, now Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about his heart, and Jesus is, is now enabled to give what we might think of as, as one of the most important verses in Scripture possibly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see the significance of Jesus' composure? You see, Jesus does that which was more right, more righteous, more God-honoring, because he was strong, because he was able to lay aside this offense against himself, because he was able to proceed with one of the greatest, if not the greatest, expressions and proclamations of the good news of salvation in himself because of his composure. See, John might have placed this passage here kind of at the beginning of his gospel to show that this is where the offenses begin against Jesus Christ. They begin in this context, in this context of evangelism. They they will flow to even greater offenses as he gets hit in the head with reeds and spit upon as, as as the soldiers kneel down before him and mock him dressed in a robe. This is where it begins. The offensive approach of Nicodemus begins in the context of Jesus' evangelistic ministry. But through all of it, Jesus remained composed. He remained fixed upon the work that he was given to accomplish, fixed upon the will of his Father. Our Savior kept calm and remained steadfast to his ministry of glorifying God the Father through his salvific work. Let me ask you this morning, how do you respond? When people offend you, when offenses are brought against you for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when when your name is slandered, when you receive hurtful degrading, demeaning, derogatory words toward yourself. How do you respond? You see, Jesus turned the conversation to the kingdom. He turned it away from himself and he turned Nicodemus' attention to his own heart. See, Jesus knew that if another was brought into the kingdom, that God would be glorified. Yes, and one more would be healed, one more would be brought from life to death, one more would receive mercy. How do we continue those conversations? Do we do it to defend our name? Or do we do it to honor Christ? That brings us to our second point, the candid Evangelist. We've seen the composed evangelist, and now we, we move on to the candid evangelist. And so we see that first response of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tells Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What an odd statement to make. Rabbi, I know that God's with you. No one can do these signs like you do. Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom. Why this statement? What connection did it have to to Nicodemus' greeting, the approach of Nicodemus? He just confessed Jesus Christ is a teacher from God, and now Jesus is talking about the kingdom. It seems as though the the import of Jesus' response is is just a, a question that's not even asked, and that is, Nicodemus, how do you know who's a teacher from God? On what basis do you think you know that.
You're blind. You, you can't even see the things of God. How do you know who it is who's from God? You can't see the kingdom. You can't see the king. How can you profess and confess to me that I'm from God? See, Nicodemus received some very strong language from the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have softened his language a bit. He could have been a little bit less forthright. He could have been a little bit less painfully candid with Nicodemus, but he wasn't. He was frank. He was open. He was sincere, as that word candid is defined in the dictionary. It was as if Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, truly, truly, I'm speaking candidly with you. I'm giving you nothing but pure, unadulterated, unaltered truth from God. You don't have eyes to see. You can't even see the kingdom. How can you know what the words of God are if you can't see the kingdom? if you can't know what the words of God are, then you couldn't know who is bringing the words of God to you. See, Nicodemus was coming to Jesus with his human knowledge, his human wisdom, his human rationality. How can a man be born when he's old? See, Nicodemus wasn't thinking of spiritual things. He was thinking of earthly things using his human wisdom and knowledge and rationality. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. That's where Nicodemus was. He was relying upon his superior knowledge, his attention to the Scripture, upon his keeping of the law, all of which only led to the impossibility of entering the kingdom. And Jesus now candidly continues to knock down all of these false ideas that Nicodemus had erected, that he had set up. You see, Nicodemus was thinking that if I'm born, if I'm in the line of Abraham, I am A-OK. I have a single birth, and that's through Abraham, and so my flesh is good flesh. Isn't that what the Jews thought? Isn't that what they thought? They, we're, we're in the line of Abraham. We're okay. We're okay. That's why Jesus' statement is so powerfully shocking, not only to Nicodemus, but then as he opens up the, the word to, to the chief scribes, the Pharisees, and he tells them that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to go into heaven before you. You see, they were thinking there's absolutely no way that those would go into heaven at all. They're not descended from Abraham. They're just sinners. And so now Nicodemus receives this shocking news that he needed a different kind of flesh. You see how candid Jesus was? He was telling Nicodemus that he had no right to rely upon his birth through Abraham, through his ancestry. He was telling him that his bloodline would be meaningless before God. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you, Nicodemus, cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was candid. He was forthright. He was speaking to Nicodemus of his need, his deep need, his great need for a spiritual rebirth. He needed to be born of water. He needed to be cleansed by the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He needed to be washed. And then he had to have the Spirit enter his heart. He had to have a heart transformation from being inclined to evil to being inclined to the will of God. You see, he had to be born of the water and of the Spirit, not of Abraham. You see how candid Jesus was? Do you, do you want Jesus to be that way with you? I think we should all be saying yes. That's the way I want Jesus to speak to me, candid, straightforward. When I sin, when I offend God, I want the Spirit to convict me without question. Without question. 
that I might come before him and profess my guilt and seek forgiveness. If this is the way we want Jesus to be with us, isn't this the way that we should be with others? In love, candid, speaking the whole word of God in love, candidly. That brings us to our third point, the consistent evangelist. And see now how Jesus just keeps on teaching the teacher. Not only was he composed and candid, but he just is persistent. He's steady. He's unfailing. He's consistent. He persevered and continued to teach, especially, especially in the face of Nicodemus' continued opposition to what he was saying. You see, Nicodemus, even though he professed Jesus Christ as a teacher who was from God, he wouldn't believe him. He didn't take his words as truth. How can these things be? That's, those are not the words of a man who is accepting the words of Jesus as truth, who was seeing him as a true teacher of God. He was questioning the veracity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He refused to believe the teaching of Christ. So much so that Jesus had to say, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He's proving to Nicodemus that he didn't have the ability to hear and to see yet. He needed this new birth. And Jesus doesn't stop there. You see, he continues to pour out his love as he continues to teach Nicodemus, as he continues to proclaim the truth in love for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, that was said to Nicodemus even after, for the second time, he had said to Jesus, I don't believe you. And Jesus kept on teaching him. He kept on giving him words of life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. He's calling Nicodemus to believe. Believe on me. You see, for Nicodemus, eternal life was all caught up in Abraham. It was all caught up in being born into the family of God. It was a matter of knowing the law, and then it was a matter of keeping the law. That's Nicodemus' whole idea of what it was to have life eternal. And Jesus Christ is saying, oh, Nicodemus, it is not so complicated. It's a free gift. Eternal life is a free gift being given out freely by God through His Son. It's the personal keeping of the law that's not required because you can't do it. But I'll do it. I'll do it for you. That one will be saved through the Son, not through His keeping of the law, that the world indeed would be saved through the Son, not just Israel. And that salvation was not tied up or bound to being a true descendant in the bloodline of Abraham, but that all tribes and tongues and peoples would be saved only if they believed in Jesus. That very thing that Nicodemus was having a hard time doing. You see, see how Jesus was consistent and persevered and breaking down all those walls that Nicodemus had set up to his own belief in Jesus Christ. He even goes as far as to tell Nicodemus where he's from. He tells him, look, I'm from heaven. And this is why I know these things that I'm telling to you, and this is why they're true. I am the one speaking to you that I not only claim to have the truth, but have established it. I was not a mere witness, but I was with God and established the truth. Indeed, I am God.
What should we do? I'd ask you first this morning to pray for your pastor, pray for your evangelist, that they may be persistent and consistent as Jesus Christ was as they take the word out. And then I'd ask you to think upon how consistent Jesus Christ was in your own life in proclaiming to you the truth. Did he stop? Was there a point in time when Jesus Christ said, you're just too hard? Absolutely not. He continued. He persisted. He didn't give up. He continued to proclaim the very word of God to you until you believed. You see, this morning should be a morning of thanksgiving to the Lord Jesus Christ that he broke down and threw barrier after barrier with you such that you would receive and hear the word of God and believe upon him such that you could be and were healed such that you could look up like that serpent placed upon the staff in the desert. Look up and really and truly see Jesus Christ lifted up and believe upon this one. And then doesn't he continue even this day, even after your conversion, to consistently proclaim his word to you? Doesn't he do that? In your besetting sins, he continues to give you the right passages to go to, the very words of God, to not only convict you of your sin, but then cause you to confess and then move you toward repentance. Yes, Jesus Christ is a consistent proclaimer of God's word through his spirit to you which does bring healing to your bones, doesn't it? And finally brings us to the committed evangelist, our fourth point. Paul believed in the power of God's word. He wrote so many things that would tell us that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul believed in the power of God's word so much so that he would be stoned and shipwrecked. He'd be imprisoned for just that, the word of God, for Jesus Christ. And all these words that Paul proclaimed to us came from the Lord Jesus Christ. He was committed to the message that he proclaimed. Nicodemus came late at night. He could have said, boy, now's not the time, my friend. I'm asleep. I'm going to bed. No, no. Jesus Christ knew the power of the word, and so that was the perfect time to open it up to Nicodemus. But that's only part of what I mean. I mean that he was so committed to the word of God that he would lay aside his will. He would lay aside his will. He would align his will with his Father so that the word would be fulfilled. And then he would lay down his life. He was so committed to the power of the word that he would lay down his life. Look at this word in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He knew it. He knew that the prophecies of old must come to pass, that they would come to pass. He was so committed to them. He was so committed to doing the will of his father that he told Nicodemus that I must be lifted up. It must come to pass. He knew that the shadow, the types and numbers that we read this morning would come to fullness and completeness in in his sacrifice. So sure of his message, of the covenant of God, of the profitability of his work, that he would go and do that for which he was sent, for which the Father sent him, the Son must be lifted up. So believed in his message so sure that he would defeat death, that he would rise again, that he would, through his death, give life to all those who would believe upon him, he lay down his life for you. That's commitment. Are you committed to the word of God this morning? Are you committed to it? Here I'm really not speaking about being a Christ-like evangelist. If the Lord is calling you to that, praise God. 
What I'm speaking of here is now uh, and asking the question, how sure are you of the profitability of doing that which God commands in His Word? How sure are you of the profitability of doing that which God commands in His Word? Knowing that as you do His Word, as you do His will, it will bring forth all of the promised fruit. Jesus knew that. That's being committed. Knowing that as I do the will of God, it will bring forth all of the promised fruit. As a child of God, how committed are you to laying aside your own will and aligning yourself with the will of your Father? that His will becomes yours. Because that comes out of the commitment to His Word, to knowing that His promises will bring forth all the fruit. You see, it would have been easy for Jesus Christ to, to step away from Nicodemus, to categorize him as a lost cause, to think I've got better things to do with my time, I've got more important people to deal with, to minister to, who's going to make me feel good about myself. But no, Jesus Christ was committed to his evangelistic work, to the word of God, knowing that it would bring forth all of the fruit that God had promised in Nicodemus. Why? Because he was committed to the Father. You see, Jesus Christ wasn't really committed to Nicodemus. Did he love him? Yes, of course he loved him. Did he care for him? Yes, of course. But Jesus' devotion, his commitment was to his Father. Seeing his Father's will being done. And as it works out, as God's will works out, as the word of life is given out, He sees the fruit of all that God had promised to do coming to bear. What was the result of Jesus' commitment to his Father? It was the glory of the Father. But it's also your salvation this morning, your healing, your spiritual nourishment and well-being. So that's really the question for us today. Are we committed to the Word of God? If not, if you're saying, well, I'm not really sure. If not, in reality, you're not convicted of its power and of its truth and of the veracity of the promises of God. If that's you this morning, I would say, repent, brother or sister. Repent and pray that God would, through His Spirit, continue to change your heart, that He would give you a renewed commitment that would be to align your will with the Father's will so that He would work in you and you would see the power contained within His Word, knowing that all the fruit that He has promised would come forth as you are obedient to it. As through his evangelistic ministry, Jesus demonstrated his nature and his love for his Father and brought healing to the children of God. Surgeons at Emory were able to straighten out my friend's spine. But only Jesus and Jesus alone is able to straighten out and heal our crooked hearts through the power of his word. The great evangelist heals the corrupt and the brokenhearted and glorifies his Father.